So good morning, Grace Church. Here we are, Friday morning, meeting in our home group locations. And I want to assure you that what's happening in terms of our Friday location is part of God's beautiful and wise and loving plan for Grace Church. And what I want to do now is, is give you a brief Bible study on James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, and then let you have some discussion time um, in, your, in your home group setting there, in, in the home group location. So let's read James 1, 22 through 27. You've got it on a sheet there. Look at what James says. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So James' topic here is that we should not be hearers only, we should be hearers and doers. So what are some ways that we can be hearers and not doers? And James gives us some specific examples in verses 26 and 27. He says, uh, for example, if we don't bridle our tongues, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, that would be you know, grumbling or complaining. That would be husbands or wives speaking harshly towards each other or towards the children. That would be speaking negatively about a manager or just someone else. It could be swearing or using obscenities. So not bridling our tongue. If we don't visit orphans and widows, that's verse 27. We're supposed to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. If we neglect the needy, if we don't care about the Syrian refugees, if we don't care about the poor and needy in our own home groups, in our own church body, if we don't care about people around us in our living situations or workplace who are struggling financially, then we are in danger of becoming hearers only and not doers. Third example, if we let ourselves be stained from the world, that's the end of verse 27 there. That's like if we let entertainment we watch entertainment that stains our souls, or if we let the world's sexual standards or views of marriage permeate our own hearts, or if we use the same language that the world uses. So these are just three examples. There's lots of ways we can be hearers only and not doers, but these are three that James gives. So James' concern is that we can at any time become hearers only and not doers. And what he means by that isn't just that we sin one time, but it's that there's an area in our lives where we know what God's Word says and we're not obeying. And we're not confessing it. We're not repenting over it. We're just continuing in knowing willful sin. And that's very dangerous because in this passage, James tells us that if we are hearers only and not doers, we're deceiving ourselves. That was in verse 22, right? Be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, and we see how we're deceived in verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So James is saying that if we have an area of our lives where we know what God's Word says, but we're not obeying Him, and we're not confessing it, we're not repenting, we're not battling against it, we're not crying out to God to change us, we're just knowingly, willingly going along with the path of sin, then we are deceived if we think our religion, our Christianity, is worth anything. It's not. Because if we have an area where we're knowingly disobeying God, we're not trusting Jesus. And if we're not trusting Jesus, we can't have any assurance that we've been saved. And if we can't have any assurance we've been saved, then we have no certainty about heaven, about forgiveness, about not going to hell. And in that case, our religion would be worthless. So this is very serious, that we not be hearers only, that we be hearers and doers. Now, what's the difference between being a hearer of the word and a doer of the word? Verse 20, verses 23 and 24, James describes 
somebody who's only a hearer. He says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So you're, you're opening up the word, you're reading it, closing it, going away, forgotten. So what's the doer of the word like? And James tells us in verses, verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Now that's a very important word. One who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. So this person opens up God's word, looks into the law, the perfect law of liberty, and perseveres, which means you keep looking, you linger over God's word, you pray, you meditate, you think, you ponder, you pray, you meditate, you think, you ponder some more. That's what James is describing, one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So the difference between being a hearer and being a doer is that the hearer doesn't persevere in the word, doesn't linger in the word. The doer perseveres and lingers. Now, why is that the difference? It's because when we persevere and linger in the word, the word will change our hearts. So we want to obey and so we are enabled to obey. Here's an example. Back when we were planting our church in San Jose, back in the States, didn't know anybody in the town we were planting a church in, so I had to get a job to pay the bills, and I worked in real estate. And uh, a few weeks into it, there was a woman who lived maybe 10 doors down, and she wanted to contract with me to help her sell her home. Very big home, very expensive home, would have been a really helpful commission in terms of my, our income. So we got all the paperwork signed. I started getting to work, marketing her home, doing the research, spending money, getting everything all set. And a couple days into the contract, she called me up and said she'd met somebody else who she remembered was an old friend who was a real estate agent. And she decided she didn't want to work with me anymore. She wanted to work with this other agent. Well, I was furious because she was breaking her contract with me. I'd already spent time and money on this. I was counting on selling that house. We needed the income. And I was very angry, very bitter, and I was not forgiving of her. I had no forgiveness for her in my heart at all. So I was in danger of becoming a hearer only and not a doer. But God gave me grace to open up the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere. Look intently at it and to persevere. And the passage that helped me was Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. If you're struggling with forgiving someone, this is a powerful passage. So here's what Jesus teaches. I'll just give you a short version. There's a slave owner who has a slave who owes him, let's say, 10 billion durham. Massive amount. The slave was never going to pay him back. And the slave master said, you owe me, you've got to pay or I'll have to throw you into jail. And the slave fell down before the slave master said, please forgive me. And the slave master forgave him 10 billion dirhams worth of debt. Unbelievable. But then the slave went out and found another slave who owed him 50 dirham and said, you owe me 50 dirham, pay me back or I'm going to have you put in jail. And that slave fell down before the slave he owed and said, please forgive this debt. And the slave would not. And when the slave master heard that the slave who he'd forgiven would not forgive the slave for the 50 dirham debt that he owed him, the slave master threw that slave into prison. And Jesus says, this is what the Father will do to us if we don't forgive each other from the heart. So here's the principle. We have been forgiven a 10 billion dirham worth of, of benefit. That is the forgiveness we have in Christ and all that comes to us through being forgiven in Christ is a 10 billion dirham windfall. We are forgiven for all of our sins, past, present, and future through Jesus' death on the cross for us. We are clothed with his perfect righteousness by faith alone. So the Father loves us and delights in us, even though we're not sinless. We're growing over, our, you know, conquering our sin, but we're not sinless. He delights in us as if we were morally perfect. 
He loves us with an everlasting love. The good work he has started in us, he will continue. He will provide us all the guidance we need, all the grace we need, all the finances and strength, wisdom, everything that we need. He will orchestrate every detail and circumstance in our lives to bring us the greatest joy in him. He'll raise us from the dead. He'll bring us into his presence forever. We have a 10 billion Durham windfall through being forgiven by Jesus Christ. Now, when other people harm us, that's like a 50 Durham loss. And so this person who broke her contract with me, that was a loss to me. But compared to the 10 billion Durham gain I have in Christ, it was like having somebody take 50 Durham from me. I mean, think about it. If you had 10 billion Durham in the bank and somebody stole 50 Durham from you, how deeply would that affect you? It wouldn't affect you very deeply because what we have in Christ will compensate for the losses. And they are real losses that people cause us. People can really hurt us. People can cause terrible heartbreak in our lives. I don't want to make light of that, but compared to what we have in Christ, what Christ gives to us completely compensates, vastly more than compensates for any hurts we experience here. So, to forgive this woman, my problem was I was focused only on the 50 Durham loss. I had forgotten about the 10 billion windfall I had in Christ. And so I needed to open up God's word, read the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere linger. And so I prayed over what I had in Christ through faith alone by salvation. I prayed over what I had in Christ and slowly I could feel the Holy Spirit using the truth of God's word to change my heart. My sense of pain of what this woman did diminished and my sense of what I had in Christ grew. And I saw so clearly all that I had in Jesus Christ and that vastly more than compensated for the loss she had caused me and so I was able to let it go. I was able to be at peace. I was able to love her. I was able to truly, from the heart, forgive her. So, you don't become a doer just by doing. What James says here is you become a doer by looking, persevering, looking, lingering over the Word. Because as we do that, the Holy Spirit will use His Word to make us want to obey and to enable us to obey. And then, as we linger over his word, he will change our hearts and then obey, step out, start to obey. Now, there's four discussion questions I've got on your sheet there. And just follow your leader's lead there in terms of how to pursue this. But Grace Church, let's not be a church of hearers only. Let's be a church who hears God's word. And because we persevere in lingering and looking at God's word, we are transformed into doers. For the good of each other as we love each other, for the good of our souls as we fight sin and trust Christ, for the good of lost people who live around us, and for the glory of Jesus Christ here in Abu Dhabi. Let's not be hearers only. Let's be hearers and doers. Amen.